And here we go. So, shalom everybody again, and uh, good evening. And uh, I hope that you enjoyed uh, uh, lectures today, the uh, the online and uh, the recorded lecture. I had the privilege and honor to introduce you here to a great friend. Hey, hey, close, close the mics. There's some terrible racket going on somewhere. Yeah, I'm going to mute everybody apart from Wave and, and Adrian. Hold on one sec. There you go. And Adrian and Wave, just if you can uh, open your mics. So uh, I would like to introduce you all to a very, very dear friend and a... Uh, um, how, how would I describe it? The, 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 a special scholar. A special of the scholar. Program. Thank you. Special yes. scholar <laughs> with one of the sharpest minds I have ever had the privilege to work with and to know. So we have here Professor Wave Nonnelly. Uh, again, one of the sharpest minds worldwide regarding uh, uh, Jesus ministries, evangelical studies, Jewish studies. Wave speaks fluent. Uh, 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 biblical Hebrew, Greek, <laughs> Latin. Uh, I also heard that in some cases he even speaks English. So he's a man of a uh, uh, great scholar. And uh, Wave, we're going to give the, the uh, stage to you. Basically, the idea of this session is question and answers regarding the sessions that we're in today which were Tree of Christianity. This is all three of us can answer, different denominations and such. Second lecture was uh, um, uh, the ministries of uh, uh, ministry of Jesus for introduction Jesus introduction one. to the ministry of Jesus part one, right. and then the third one would have been problem in translation between sites and text. So these were the uh, lectures uh, today. So without further ado, Wave, please introduce yourself. Good evening, everybody. Good morning for me. Uh, thank you for being a part of this class. I think it's amazing that as, as much time as you have been off of work, away from work, and struggling just to make things uh, work with budget and, and family and home, um, that you're willing to invest, to put into yourself, so that when things do come back, you come back bigger and stronger than ever. And I, I, I very much admire that. So um, I, I think that in my first session, I mentioned to you all that my goal was not to teach you anything. You have, were born and grew up where you did and uh, uh, being raised in, in Judaism, you have a whole lot already inside of you that you can pull from to help groups that come to study with you. We also talked a little bit, I think Omer especially did, about the difference between these groups that when you are dealing with Protestants, Evangelicals, Charismatics, Pentecostals, that you're not dealing with the same animal as with uh, Jewish tourists or with uh, Roman Catholic or Greek or Eastern Orthodox Christians who come. Each of these groups are coming with a little bit different set of goals or desires. And so to have a really successful group, uh, to, to perform well with your group, you have to know the kind of people that you're working with. And then I think it's in their and your best interest to give them what they've come to Israel for. And so this has been my goal in working with all of these classes. I think that you are the third that I've done with um, uh, Oma and Adrian, and I've done another one with Yad Ben Svi, um, and we have others coming up in the future. But um, in all of these uh, classes, our goal has been to equip you to be as successful as possible in dealing with this particular group of people. Uh, Protestant, evangelical, whatever you want to call uh, them, that have different goals for their trips. So you heard the stuff. You heard uh, what Omer said, and you can address questions to Omer on his sessions. You've heard uh, what I had to say on backgrounds of Jesus and then uh, connecting sites and, um, uh, and texts or passages in the Bible. And... Uh, uh, feel free to fire away. 
We have just one little update. We do have, I believe, in this group this time, some local Christians. <laughs> a little bit more varied this time. All right. Omar, can I ask first, just because I was bold enough to unmute myself? No. Yes, go ahead. Please, Asaf, go for it. All right, first of all, thank you so much for your lectures. I enjoyed both of them very much. And I have two main questions. The first one is, what can you tell us about the role of prayer at the time of Jesus? We know that prayer was not formally canonized at this point. We know that Jewish prayer did exist. When Jesus prays, what can we learn? What can you tell us about it? This is my first question. And the second question is related. When you were referring to Jesus and Nazareth um, opening not a book, but rather a scroll, my question was, at this point of time, when the Hebrew Bible was not fully canonized in order, who chooses on the Sabbath what you're going to read? Like, does he just have the whole library accessible and he picks one out and this is what he comes on? Like, I, I never fully understand, understood it and I've asked pastors and scholars and I never got an answer that I was quite happy with. Thank yeah, you. Those are both really good questions, Asaf. Um, the first one, role of prayer. If you look in the Hebrew Bible, there is prayer going on and from the very beginning, but it's, it's not emphasized that much. There's just... You would think that when you go to the Hebrew Bible, you would find an emphasis on prayer that is consistent and that is at a high level all the time. Why? Because we're looking from where we are back through uh, the Judaism of uh, the time of Jesus and even before. Uh, but the reality is there's not that much emphasis in, in the Bible. All you have to do is go online and, and look it up in a by, uh, and a Bible concordance, you know, that lifts frequency, or if you've got a hard copy of something like um, Avraham Evan Shoshan's uh, Concordancia, uh, you can look and just look at Lehit uh, Palel uh, or Tefillah or whatever you want to look up, and it's just it's just not there that much. It seems like that, that that prayer began to really be emphasized between uh, the Testaments between the time of the, the closing of the Hebrew Bible and the beginning of the New Testament. And so it is indeed a very Jewish development to emphasize prayer in the way that it's emphasized as it shows up in the New Testament, where it's everywhere. And then um, uh, also you find it in the scrolls, you find it in um, the Sfarim um, Achitzoniim, you find those uh, find it also in the Dead Sea Scrolls. It's everywhere. So something has happened. Um, so I, I, I'm writing this article right now on the prayer life of Jesus, not what he said, but how he prayed, the, the methods, the body posture and all this stuff. And what I'm finding at every point is, and, and I'm anchoring this, I, I'm locating this in the literature prior to the, the New Testament, is that Jesus does not pray like we pray today. And it doesn't matter whether you're Roman Catholic or whether you're Protestant. Um, we have certain modes of prayer. You, know, you bow your head, you fold your hands, you close your eyes. N never does Jesus' prayers ever look like that. It ne they just don't. And they, they look like, when you compare that, his prayer posture and you know, what he's doing with his hands, what he's doing with his eyes, et cetera, et cetera. He is thoroughly a, a Jew within his time. Um, and to me, that's fascinating uh, because now we have this interesting challenge based on the literary evidence. We have this challenge. He prays like this and we pray like that. Now, what do we do? I love that. So uh, the role of prayer in Jesus' day, another thing is that prayer is becoming standardized by Chazal, but they refuse to um, dictate every part of prayer. So you have a bracha at the beginning and you have a, um, a, some kind of um, a, 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 a conclusion that you are supposed to uh, add to any kind of uh, prayer like the Shemona Esrei or the Amidah or whatever that's in the process of developing. And when you look at the contents of Jesus' prayer, what did he pray? Things like the Our Father um, in Matthew chapter 6 or, or Luke, I think it's chapter 6 as well. Um, every every um, 
invocation, every request. Avinu um, Sheba Shemaim, exactly what the what Chazal is saying. Um, uh, it, it it all sounds very rabbinic. So he's he's using he's adapting you know culture already existing cultural models in the things that he uh, prays. So he's just a it's just perfectly situated within his time. Uh, I find that this is amazing because um, we have been told by more liberal especially German scholarship beginning in the uh, 1700s that uh, the Jesus that you see in the gospels is a Greek Jesus. He's a Hellenized Jesus. Uh, he is a Jesus that was basically a, a literary creation of the early church. Well, if those gospels come to us from Asia Minor, from Greece, from Italy or whatever, and those are made up by people who are non-Jews, not native Hebrew speaking, not involved in rabbinic Judaism, then it would, it's impossible for them to have come up with the stuff that they come up with in the biblical gospels. And this includes the prayer life of Jesus. He doesn't look Greek. He doesn't look Western. He doesn't look um, uh, pagan. He's, he, he, is, he is thoroughly Jewish. So how would people who don't know about Judaism in the land of Israel. How do they come up with a uh, with a a picture that looks so uh, first century style Israeli? And um, I think the the model is wrong. the The beginning, the presupposition, or the beginning point is wrong. So that on num on point number one, number two, uh, wait, wait, just, opening up the the scroll wait, wait, in, in Nazareth. Um, wait, wait, yes. Quick, quick. Uh, yeah. Sorry, drop. We're gonna speak about this about the prayer, Asaf, at Nebi Samuel, when we are going to speak about the first temple period way of prayer in emphasis of Hana, the prayer of Hana, mm -hmm. we will speak about it. And that's, that will give you a full closure to your question. I'm sorry, Wade, please go ahead. No, I'll, I'm gonna trust you to take care of that and fix what I broke uh, at Nebi Samuel, All right? So uh, the second question, Asaf, uh, to unroll, is, it has to happen. You can't translate it. He opened the book as we get in most English translations. You're not opening and there are no books in Jesus' day. Those will come into play in the late second and early third centuries AD. So there aren't books circulating. And especially even up to today, you're not allowed to read from a book um, from the Bima in a Beit Knesset. It just doesn't happen, uh, even if there were books. So. Um, he un it, it, those those words are better translated. He unrolled the scroll. Now, how did he get the um, the uh, Sefer Yeshayahu? I don't know. Was it an accident? Did somebody just hey read this, or was it a part of a developing Haftarah? And I think that the, the, does everybody understand what I'm saying? Okay, so someone has evidently already read the um, the, uh, the pasuk from the Torah. I think that maybe what, what is happening is Jesus is, is called and he's the second in, in line and he's reading a developing liturgy, a developing we, um, uh, lectionary, we call it in English. I don't know a, a, a Hebrew word, but it's a haftarah. It's the corresponding part of the, uh, the Nevi'im. And so when it's handed to him, uh, he evidently recognizes, I'm just making this up because none of this is in the text. He recognizes, ah, this is Sefer Yeshayahu. And so he says, what are we going to read from that? Well, we're going to read from chapter 61. And so he unrolls, he probably has to unroll the whole thing, right? Uh, and to get to the very end. So, you know, the babies are crying and the, and, and the, and the mothers are sh shushing them. And uh, he's unrolling the whole scroll until he gets to chapter 60, only 66 chapters. So he gets to chapter 61 and he begins to read um, uh, Rachel Elohim Alai, Adonai Elohim Alai. So I, I'm, um, I'm comfortable with that. I think to, to continue, just to move forward, is that uh, it says in Luke 4 that he, um, he, um, he rolled the scroll back up. That would take a while, too. And everybody's sitting around thinking about, okay, what is he going to do with this uh, chapter 61? It says he handed the scroll to the attendant. The attendant is, uh, is the chazan. 
And the chazan is not what today what the chazan was in Jesus' day. The chazan in Jesus' day of the Beit Knesset was he was the go-to person for everything. He did it all, including teaching the children from the very beginning, from age five, six years old. And so more than likely, uh, this chazan taught Jesus his Aleph bet and taught him how to read in uh, Sefer Vayikra. Good. Next up. Thank you. And may I ask something? Yes, Yossi. Yes. Um, you uh, said that uh, Jesus is talking sometimes in parables. And you gave uh, an example that in Chazal there are um, hundreds or maybe thousands of parables. And I think this is an understatement because it's written specifically twice in the New Testament that Jesus talked only in parables. It's in Mark uh, chapter 4, 34, and also in Matthew 13, also 34. And I think the Greek text is very clear. It says, Kechoris parabodes uden elali autos, without parables, he didn't talk to them. Um, Mark adds something, so there is a small difference. He says, Kat Idian, in private, to, the di to his disciples, he explained. But it's only to the disciples. To the, to the groups, to the multitudes, it's only a parable. And the, the old Christian culture is not so much built upon the parables, which seem to be a major part in what Jesus has said. Yeah, what do I you agree. say about it? I agree, I agree Yossi. Um, depending on which scholar you listen to, you will hear that Jesus um, parables, when you add all four of the, go or the three gospels, you add Matthew, Mark, and Luke together, there aren't any parables in John. Um, you have somewhere between 42 and up to 79 parables. The question is, how do you classify a parable? I think that in Chazal, there are more than 2,000, and I think that there are way more than 2,000 because I think a lot of the words that Chazal say, like the words of Jesus, have been misclassified. If it's only a line or two, there, scholars, most scholars, they're looking for really long parables, like the parable of the Good Samaritan, you know, that goes on for verse and verse and verse. But um, sometimes Jesus' parables will be very short, and and on many occasions, the the um, uh, Mishalim and Chazal are also very short, you know, like a, a, a sentence or two. So that, that corresponds very well. Now, um, about the frequency of parable, I think you have to get into the, uh, the, the function or the purpose of parable. And when, when you compare what Chazal, how Chazal uses uh, Mashal and how um, uh, Yeshua um, uses Chazal, they are very, very similar. They're taking a, what I call a snapshot, a picture, from everyday life that is so common that everybody can relate to it. Everybody knows a man who had two sons and one of them runs away and the other one stays faithful. Um, everybody knows about a harvest that's about to take place and the, the father is begging uh, his children to help get in the harvest before the big rain comes. We, they know of these things in that world of, of, of the first century. So, um, Jesus is using mashal exactly the way that Chazal uses mashal to illustrate, to take some sort of a heavenly um, thought or, or, or concept and make it very concrete. It's kind of like we're using Zoom or we use uh, PowerPoint to make things visual. That's what, that's what these great teachers in the first century BC, first century AD are doing with mashal and uh it's so much has been written on this joachim Jeremias, for example german scholar again uh jewish german 
um, I, his, I, his, the, the approach I think is wrong. They take the, the position that, that, that Jesus is using parable to hide things. That would be completely out of step with everything in that culture, which is using parable to open people's understanding, to make it accessible to the average person. So I'm not at all surprised that we see mashal in the teachings of Jesus because there are more than 2,000 in Chazal, like you said. Um, I'm not at all surprised in watching how he uses it and how he uses it to illustrate and to, and to make these um, spiritual realities very concrete, very touchable uh, to everyone in his audience. And they're, they're from the most educated to the illiterate and everybody in between, and he's able, like, the, like Chazal are able, to communicate to everybody. Maybe that didn't answer directly, but I'm trying. <laughs> uh, can I tell you? Omar, you can, can, I, you can jump in. Oh, we have, uh, Eba has a question. Yeah, hello. First of all, thank you very much uh, for the very interesting lectures. Thank you. Um, I have a question which relates a bit to geography, I suppose. Uh, Bethlehem, uh, do evangelicals visit Bethlehem? And then uh, do you talk about um, the discrepancy between uh, the uh, Gospels of Matthew and Lucas, uh, which, uh, you know, tell us the story of the birth uh, in Bethlehem against uh, Mark and John? We don't mention Bethlehem as the uh, birthplace of Jesus. Uh, I can. Uh, it's a great question, and I, I I love studying those birth narratives. You're right. There is no. There are no birth narratives in Mark or John. In Matthew and Luke, I think that. And I was taught as a freshman in college, first year student, first semester student when I went to university, that. Um, there are uh, contradictions, discrepancies, and that sort of thing going on in the Gospels of Matthew and Luke. Here's where, Yossi, uh, you read Greek, you can see these things. This is a, that's a very helpful tool. Um, what I think is a, a, of major importance is that Matthew, read it carefully, does not really describe the birth of Jesus. Matthew is describing a series of events and details that are considerably uh, uh, um, further along in the, in the story, in the Jesus story. So that in, in Luke, he is, uh, Jesus is always called by the Greek word brephos. If you want to write this down, this is good for groups. B-R-E-F-O-S, brephos which if, if you look at the, the, the Septuagint, is everybody following Omer? Yeah, looks like it. The, yeah. the Greek translation of the Old Testament, every time that, you, whenever you get the word in Hebrew, yonek, a, a suckling infant, a newborn, we would say, the word brephos is used in the LXX or the Septuagint. Um, so Luke is telling us the story at the flashpoint of birth. He's talking about um, uh, being born, being laid in a manger. He's talking about the uh, shepherds coming the same night of Jesus' birth, um, this night in the city of David. Um, and uh, uh, and he, he's circa, uh, he, under, he undergoes Brit Milah on day eight. They go under, uh, they do Tavul and the Pidion Habin at day 40. And, uh, and all of this is in Luke. So Luke is telling us all this stuff right at the very beginning, the first month or so of the life of Yeshua. If you go to the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew does not use the word brephos for Jesus. Matthew uses the Greek word paideon. And P-E-D, it means moving by the feet, moving by the legs. And so Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew, the way what Matt, the part of the story that Matthew is telling is that Jesus is uh, 16, 18 months old uh, or, or more. Uh, and um, so the time frame of Matthew and Luke is not overlapping. They're talking about different time periods. Luke, very early in the first month and a half of Jesus' life. And for, uh, for Matthew, the um, uh, a year and a half to two years. 
And uh, that corresponds, by the way, with Matthew 2.16 that says that when Herod uh, was um, killing the babies in Bethlehem, it was two years old and under. And that really gives us a, a good uh, in, in, a, a chronological or time indicator uh, that, um, uh, that we're looking at the life of Jesus somewhere just under two years old. To answer the question, by the way, regarding the visit of the evangelical groups in Bethlehem, Bethlehem will be what we categorize as a sea site. Now, the Church of Nativity and Shepherd's Field, they both are sea sites. Some can say maybe a B site. You, you, everybody knows what I'm talking about, A, B, and C from the lecture? Okay, so Bethlehem itself as a city, Bethlehem, that's an A site. Bethlehem is Bethlehem. We know that from archaeological digs. But do we know where exactly is the place of the birth? No, we do not. So when you have a group of evangelical who wants to come and see Bethlehem, unlike the Catholic or the Greek Orthodox, you cannot point and say, this is the star of Bethlehem, because last time we read the Gospels, the star of Bethlehem was up in the heavens, not in the middle of a Byzantine church. But many of the evangelical would like to see where is Bethlehem, the little town of Bethlehem. So some groups, I can speak on, 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 on our uh, institute, some groups do go to Bethlehem, not because of the Church of Nativity, definitely not because of Shepherd's Field. They go there because they want to be in the vicinity of where it happened, which is one of the greatest teaching moments that you as a guy together with the pastor can do is debate about what is the actual birthday of Jesus, which we all agree was not Christmas. So, and this is a nice way to, to uh, harvest in the group and, and speak about it. When we leave Bethlehem and we have had um, guides from Bethlehem, there are always lots of questions on my bus. And so we take the opportunity, whether we're going to Ir David or um, uh, the uh, Israel Museum or wherever we're going next to sort of unpack um, to revisit the things that were discussed when we were in Bethlehem. And um, that's always a good time. It's a, for, for us, for me, it's a growing time because lots of questions and then uh, um, give and take um, discussion it usually helps people uh, to clarify things in their minds, things that they've heard that maybe they'd never heard before from the guide or things that uh, they saw that didn't get fully discussed or explained. That's a, that's a really wonderful time to use that, that bus time, um, not to sit and talk with the driver, but rather to, to work with your people. That's, that's really what evangelicals and what, and what all Protestants want is explain to me. I want content. I, I want to connect text with, with um, reality in the land at this time. So um, yeah, just one more question. So it's important also to point out the connection of Bethlehem and the Davidic line. Yeah, um, I think it's I think it's good to go all the way back to the, the to, to the, uh, the the Ruth and Boaz uh, story, and to um, uh, connect to Bethlehem uh, there. Also, to uh, discuss the um, uh, the uh, prophecy in in um, uh, Micah. Um, chapter 5, verse 2. And interestingly, um, even in Chazal, I don't remember the exact location, I can dig it for you if, if, if you're not familiar with it, but even Chazal are, indicate, are, are pointing to Micah chapter 5, verse 2, and Micah's words that uh, the um, uh, Mashiach ben David will be born in, um, in Beit Lechem. Another, another that can be brought was up. This, uh, was this an understanding already at the time of Jesus, or is this something which came later? That's a difficult thing to say, because it, when you are working in a Chazal, you're working with an archaeological excavation, and you have to look at who, who's speaking, what, uh, what rabbinic authority is giving this, this, this information, and then other things within the text, like the mention of people like... Um, King Agrippa or, or, um, or King Herod, things that are mentioned within the text 
like archaeologists do to date the material. But this would be my position on this. That's a great question, Eva. Um, um, is how how do you date the how do you date this material after the uh, after the the rise of Christianity and from time to time the conflict between uh, the um, rabbinic authorities and the church authorities? To me, it would be less likely at that time for a tradition to develop among Chazal that the um, Messiah is born in Bethlehem according to that specific prophecy in um, uh, Michayahu. So uh, I think that more than likely that that tradition developed prior to the birth of Jesus and is less likely to have developed after the birth of Jesus. Am I making sense, guys? And uh, the re yep. you understand the reason why? Yep. It's less likely for that to have developed after the the birth of Christianity than it would be for that to be an, an ancient, an old um, uh, understanding of the of Tanakh um, prior to the birth of Jesus and the birth of early Christianity. Other question, folks? While you're having a think, I would I just just wanted to add something about Bethlehem. Is that I have found, and this is not obviously every denomination is varied in their approach, but I've found that working with uh, Philippine evangelicals, who nearly all grew up as Catholic, they they don't mind going into Catholic or even Orthodox churches. They don't have a problem with that. Uh, for them, it's part of the culture that they grew up in. And even though they've come out and they've been rebaptized as adults and so on, and they've been born again as Christians, uh, they don't have any problem going in to look at historical sites. I found with Baptists, people who grew up in the South, where you know they, they would never dare of stepping it's there down there, stepping into a Catholic church. They like architecture. They appreciate architecture. You know, if, if it was on the tour to go to uh, Mount Tabor, then they would see the fact they would be very interested. So many of them to see the fantastic church on Mount Tabor. But when they go into places like that, like this, where in the uh, the Nativity Church and especially in the Sepulchre Church, all the other stuff that's going on, the grandiosity of the gold, the gilting, and everything like that, and the rituals with the and the people's weird senses of dress and the chaos, that's for them is like, get me out of here. So you get from one extreme that doesn't even, I have groups that don't even step into Bethlehem. And I have other groups that spend a good half day there. They go to the shepherd's fields, they pray in the shepherd's field. It's very, very varied. I don't think there's any, you can say all evangelicals do this. They don't. There's a big variation. Also don't forget folks that Bethlehem is an icon. It's important. It's an icon. It's like going to Paris and not visiting the Eiffel Tower. It's, it's about the same idea. Yeah. So people would like to say, yeah, I've been to Bethlehem. But usually yeah, this, will be, this will be uh, uh, determined by the agent or mm -hmm. by the pastor. Depends who knows better the land. Mm -hmm. How you deal with the year Jesus was born when we know that Herod was died for BC? Is that a question for me, Ailey? <laughs> For anybody. Okay. Take it away, uh, but I'll take it. How do you feel like? Go for if it. You want, go ahead. Yeah. What's that? If you want to, go ahead. I'll stop and you add if, if, if you want. Sure. Um, we all know that the year zero is not year zero. The same as we know that the, the calendar that we're using today is not the calendar that was used during the time of Jesus, nor the Yuliani calendar was not in the time of Jesus. It was the Hebrew calendar. And the count was related to the creation of the earth, not to the birth of a specific person. In this case, of course, Jesus. So there are a lot of scholars who, who try to understand what is the year of the birth of Jesus under the understanding that Herod died in the year minus four. So Jesus could not have been born up to minus four, because if this is the case, the whole notion of the massacre of the innocents makes no sense biblically. So it was a little bit before. Now, when there is there is a, there's actually a movie about this. There's a lecture that we did in the Bible Center on our YouTube channel. You can check it out. 
the birth time of Jesus. And uh, I heard several scholars talking about the year minus five, minus six, and that in comparison to the time of the year when Jesus was born. And this is under the uh, assumption that you use Zachariah from the uh, 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 house, uh, uh, oh, I forgot the, the house name. Wave, help me out. The, the, the priesthood. Avia. Avia, thank you. Avia, Avia. 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 The priesthood watch of Avia, that Zechariah was a member of that, and then you can, you can count back. Then he gives you roughly the, uh, 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 the time of the year that Jesus, Jesus was born. I strongly urge you to look at the Bible Center Education uh, 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 movies and find that lecture, Birth Time of Jesus. Wave, you want to add anything? This is a, even a little bit more speculative, but it's a lot of fun. So I think maybe we'll just go there and and because it won't cost us anymore. Uh, that is, if Jesus was born in AD six, even AD seven would be a would be a, in this discussion a, a better date. Then when you have um, uh, Herod Archelaus, who was the uh, the ethnarch of Judea, Samaria, and Idumea. And he is deposed and sent into exile by the Romans in AD 6. In AD 6, Luke has, in Luke chapter 3, a discussion of Jesus for the first time being brought to celebrate Pesach uh, in Jerusalem by his parents. How old is he? He is, he is 12 or 13. And so there would likely be a double purpose. Not only is he um, safe to come to back to Jerusalem, and uh, Archelaus was was a, a, a vicious person. He was actually worse than Herod, um, you know, like father, like son. And so for 13, 12 or 13 years, Jesus has been away from Jesus, not been in Jerusalem. He's been in Egypt. He's been in Nazareth, but he has not been in um, Judea. So he shows up at exactly the time when he is becoming a young man and he is becoming responsible to obey the uh, Torah Moshe um, for himself, not through his parents, but for himself. And he makes, he, he makes the, the pilgrimage um, as required by Torah to come and celebrate Pesach in Yerushalayim. And the timing could not work better uh, for that scenario if we're looking at a birth not in zero, but in six to seven BCE. Well, that's a great Thank point. Thank you. Archelaus. Great, sir. Archelaus ruled from four no, BCE well, just, just six. until yeah. six CE. <laughs> And then was exiled to France. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah, Gaul. Uh, about ten, uh, about ten years. Yeah. Professor, is there a chance you could re-explain? Because I did follow your lecture very carefully when you explained the cock crows, but I didn't fully we'll understand that. how you made the association from uh, yeah. the rooster interpretation to the trumpets. This was not entirely clear, at least to me. So. If there is time and we're not going over, uh, if that's a possibility. Yeah, the um, it, it's it's part of it is a problem with language. The Greek reads, Yossi, help me on this if I mispronounce, phone alektor, and it can mean uh, cock crow, the sound of a um, of a male chicken, but it can also it there's enough ambiguity, you know, un lack of clarity in the language. It can mean the phone like um, phonetic uh, can be the sound and alektor can be a man, uh, an adult male. Same thing for Hebrew. And this is the reason Chazal have to discuss this in the, uh, uh, in the um, rabbinic literature. The, uh, the, the uh, phrase um, kriyat hagever can be translated the uh, call of a rooster it can also be the sound of a man or a man's voice. So the problem in some measure is um, the 
uh, lack of clarity of both of these languages that are in play when we're talking about New Testament, we're talking about the Greek language, but we're also talking about a Hebrew underlayer that every that most everybody's well, some of the anti-Semites are not willing to accept it, but Jesus is Hebrew speaking. The early, uh, his early disciples are, are all Jewish and Hebrew speaking. It's just thoroughly Hebraic. So we are dealing in some measure with the bilinguality, uh, two, two languages. And in both situations, you have this lack of clarity. So you have to dive into the literature and you have to look carefully at, at what Josephus is saying. You have to look at the archaeology. You remember the uh, stone that was found um, at the at the bottom of the temple at the end of the western wall, uh, and it says to the place of trumpeting. Um, and then you read also in all of that stuff. I think is that available to them, Omer? All of the material from Chazal, where there's this debate about what is phone alector. And a story is told about this guy, Gabini, the temple crier. And he is uh, calling out the watches of the night. And King Agrippa, there's one of those things where you, one of those pieces of the, of the story that help you to isolate or to identify this as being a first century story. Because uh, King Agrippa is uh, 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 CE 41 to 44, something like that. And uh, so it's right in the middle of the days of the book of Acts. It's after Jesus, but it's, it's, it's within New Testament times, first century. And um, it says that he heard this Gabini, the temple crier, calling out uh, the watches. And, and it said he loved his voice. It was so melodious that when he got back to his palace, he sent the guy presents, um, it, some sort of a reward for being such a good temple crier and they tell this story this is not a this is not mashal this is the historia they tell this story in order to support the position of one of Chazal who says it's the sound of a man's voice others in Chazal say no it's the sound of a trumpet but no one is saying it's the crow of a uh, rooster so and the archaeological information to that as well that they've never found in any any layers from the second century BC to the late until the Barkovpa era. Effectively, they've never found chicken bones in any layer in Jerusalem. They've never found them anywhere in Judea except the far southern Hebron hills where there were chicken farms. And that we also have this is teaching, related we to have in, this teaching in the Mishnah. From, yes, we have the teaching yeah. from it's uh, in Bavakama, in Bavakama. Uh, in, in the Mishnah. I think it's uh, Perik Se uh, Sheva, something like that, Zion. Yeah. So, um, and and I I showed that I had a slide for that, didn't I? Or no? I didn't think, I have a slide for that? I think maybe. I think so. If not, I've got the quotes from Safari. I can send them to people as a picture or something like okay, that. Okay, between text and sites. Let me check real quick. Sure. Give it a flick. Get your next questions ready, folks. <laughs> okay, Bava Kama uh, 7 7. Uh, can I share a screen? Yeah, you're you, you, you cool. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Can everyone see that or no? You can see it, Omer? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so is this material going to be made available to them or not? Yes, it will. Which is this? Which was this? this oh, yeah, is, of course. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is between text and sites. It was the second yeah. lecture. Yeah. If you've not updated any of these PowerPoints, we've still got them from last time. Right. Uh, a little bit, tweaked them a little bit, but it's the most of it is okay. is, is original. Okay. All right. So um, let me stop share. And yeah, you know, in, in those, uh, I'm I was trying to pack in as, as much as I could because you only have so much time. And man, there's so much there to work with, not just New Testament, but then when you get into these other supporting literatures like the scrolls or Chazal or the archaeology, geography, 
there's just so many things that with different directions we can go. So I'm sorry, I didn't mean to rush through that discussion, but it, it is available to you on those PowerPoints. And I really do want to encourage you guys to push uh, in to use um, this, uh, the uh, non-biblical material, because as, as Protestants, we are taught that all of that stuff is bad and you're not supposed to mess with it or it's going to hurt you. Just totally stupid. Um, the answers to so many questions in Brit Chadasha, it's in that literature. It's in the scrolls. It's in Chazal. It's it's in apocryphal or Sfarim uh, Achitzoniim, and um, it, th that's important material for us, for everybody. So, if you know some of this stuff already, and these questions come up, or you even you bring them up on your trips your groups then um they're going to they will learn not just okay well that's what it really means but they're also going to learn hey that stuff is not quote bad it's it's not um wrong it's not going to turn me into one of the meaning you know i won't become a means just because i read the stuff and um I, I on when i'm doing groups in israel i every location adrian help me here it is it is full on it doesn't matter where the stuff's coming from geography no, archaeology ancient yeah. literature in the bible outside the bible mm -hmm. hebrew bible new testament it's all um fair game yeah i'm going to cover this in a, in a little bit about the there's a very small lecture i think on the third day uh, which is which covers in dealing with the groups and the pastors. I mean, most of the pastors know their Bible extremely well. So you're not going to be able to contribute. You're not the pastor of the group, but you can bring external material which can help enrich that text and how to approach that with the pastor, how to discuss it beforehand, how to uh, get that into play is part of the dynamic of the methodology of working with the evangelical groups. Uh, Gabby had his hand up and I can see Elan afterwards just afterwards. very quickly a lot of times when we get to toward the end uh third uh, third next to last day last day people are asking how do i continue this kind of approach this you know all you know uh, every, uh, and one of the things that i say yeah is buy a one one volume big thick josephus uh and because we talk about Josephus so much and they go, oh yeah, well, obviously. And they don't realize that even though they're not a professor or a guide, uh, wow, you can go on Amazon and you can buy a used Josephus for $12. <laughs> and then you have access to everything. I said, there's a subject index, there's a Bible index in the back and you can access Josephus for the rest of your life. Uh, there was a hand up, please. I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so my question is uh, regarding the extra biblical uh, fonts that we have uh, that would be justifying the fact that Jesus was not married. I mean, how would that be accepted by the, the community at his time of a young single person who's being a teacher, a rabbi, and he's not obeying the very first commandment in the Bible? It's a very good question, especially when you look at other components of Jesus' life. He's in, the, he's in Beit Knesset every Shabbat. He's praying multiple times each day. None of these things are going on in the Hebrew Bible. This is happening through the Torah Shabbat Peh. Uh, he wears tzitzit. Uh, he, te he, he uses parable. He, he, te he preaches sermons. He quotes the Bible by heart. He interprets the Bible using the same midot as uh, Hillel um, and the same uh, argumentation. There's just so much. That it's like, okay, then how is it that this, is it possible that, that this part of, of his life can be completely disconnected from the world that he is a part of? And um, my response would be no, that you've, we know so much of these other areas, we've got to begin to explore the tradition to see where all of this plugs in. Why no wife? Why no children? Um, 
and you have this um, statement by one of Chazal. I think it's Shimon ben Azai, and he says, um, "My soul, uh, nafshi, is in my soul is in love with Torah. Let others perpetuate the world." So you have it even within the. And they're getting on his case. Get married, have kids, and he goes, "Sorry." My soul is in love with Torah. Let others perpetuate the world. So you have this situated already within the movement of the perushim um, of, of the day. Not only that, but we have evidence from Josephus and the Dead Sea Scrolls that you have a community of Jews living in the land of Israel at the same time of Jesus, and they are not getting married and they're not having children. Whoa. Okay, so now we've got it situated in the movement of the Perushim, we have it in the movement of the Essene, and, and Philo, Philo, um, Philo Judaeus of Alexandria. Do you, do you guys, are you familiar with Philo? F-I-L-O, P-H-I-L-O, Philo of Alexandria. First century Jew, first century Jew, like Josephus. And he says that there is a um, movement among the Jews in Egypt um, and they're called therapeutae, like we use the word therapeutic, therapeutae. And among these therapeutae, many of them choose to not marry. So these are Jews who are not marrying. Um, Yochanan Amadbil, John the Baptist, also Jewish, land of Israel, not married. You can push it all the way to Paul. We don't know exactly what his marital status was. Uh, was he a widower? Was he divorced or whatever? But at the time that he's writing, he says that he's not married. So it's a really interesting thing. We think about, oh, Jesus, he sticks out like a thumb that hurts, you know? But the reality is you've got all kinds of stuff when you start casting around in these various literatures, Dead Sea Scrolls, Josephus, Philo, other places in the New Testament. And there are evidently a lot of Jewish men contrary to the teachings of the um, uh, of the perushim and chazal there are a lot of jewish men who are choosing to not marry and i don't like that and i'm married and i think it would have been cool if they'd all gotten married um because um women are beautiful and kids are wonderful so i would have preferred it otherwise but i'm about two thousand years too late to the party <laughs> Elan, you had a question? Hi. Great question, um, Gabi. I, I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, hello. Thank you. I just wanted to ask, I don't know if uh, you, you're going to deal with it maybe later, but I was interested in something that comes up when I'm guiding it, but how to talk about Jesus' relationship with the two major Jewish institutions of his time, which is the temple and Sanhedrin, right? So the temple, I think of it um, like Mark 15, when he's cleaning the temple, yeah, um, as one way that Jesus is dealing with it, but he's never really saying that. And on the other hand, the Sanhedrin, it's um, very negative. Yeah? But as you said, he sounds like a uh, pulshit. Yeah, like a Pharisee. So there, there's some tension there. So if you have something to say or if it will be dealt with later, thank you. Yes. Uh, Any places. The, the temple cleansing is, is a very interesting episode. And when you read all of the Gospels, uh, you, one of the things that comes up is that in the Gospel of John, the temple cleansing is at the very beginning of Jesus' ministry. It's not in the last week of his life. And then when you dig down even deeper, you realize that there are a lot of details in the story that John tells that are different than the details that you get in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. I have concluded that these are two different temple cleansings. So one is at the beginning, the first year, and one is in, at the end of the third year or going into year four of Jesus' ministry. Um, so they're separated by approximately a three-year period. I have a feeling that there could be an, at one and maybe even two um, um, times at Pesach when Jesus um, comes to uh, uh, Jerusalem for Pesach 
and he may have done it then too. We just don't have the record. So if, uh, if you have one temple cleansing and what happened in the story, maybe the uh, Tzadukim, uh, um, maybe the Kohen Gadol, um, maybe the other chief priests, the, the high priestly families, they could look past that. But if it's been done at least twice, and maybe more. Um, I think that by the the last time, what we get in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, their their response is, "This will not happen again on our watch. We just can't have this every year. The same problem: bad publicity, business goes down, we get a worse um, reputation." And so I think it was that time at that point that they uh, that they step in. Here's another way of looking at it. You have um, Bava Ben Buta uh, uh, around the time of the birth of Jesus, and he goes into the temple and no one is there. Uh, you get this in uh, what the, where, I, I forget where the location of this. It's, it's, it's in the, the, the Bavli. I think it's in somewhere like Bava Batra 4a, something like that. I have the text somewhere, maybe I think in one of our studies. And he sees that the temple is completely empty and he pronounces a curse on the temple priesthood. He says, may the, may the houses of those who made this house desolate become themselves desolate or desolated, destroyed. And um, he goes and he buys a huge flock of sacrificial animals. He brings them into the temple court and he says, if anybody needs to offer sacrifice, lay hands on one of these animals and go sacrifice. So evidently it has to do with this manipulation of the currency and the monopoly of the sacrificial system that was not allowing people to worship God, uh, to continue um, uh, the, the practice of sacrifice because it wasn't affordable. You get this after the time of Jesus with um, Rabbi Shimon ben Gamliel. And in the days of the apostles, the, the disciples of Jesus, he comes into the temple court and he made a ruling um, that lowered the price of the two doves from $1,500 to $15. To one five dollars. What was the reason for the ruling? Because the price had been so elevated, so jacked up by the tzadukim, uh, by the koanim, that no one could afford even the cheapest offering. So we have problems on both ends of, of sides of Jesus' life. Baba ben Buta and Rabbi Shimon ben Gamliel on the on the opposite end. In every piece of literature, Josephus, Dead Sea Scrolls, apocryphal material, pseudepigraphical material, um, uh, the rabbis, you have statements that are uh, anti-temple, but more not so much anti-temple, anti-priesthood. The Dead Sea Scrolls, for example, say that the priests who control the temple have defiled it. It's a defiled house. In fact, they will quote a passage in Michayahu, and they will say that this is the high place, the, 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 the temple in Jerusalem in their day is, is, is like a, a high place of pagan worship. Uh, you get this in, I forget, I think it's um, um, the Pesher on Chavakuk. In the, in the, Sorry, um, I didn't. Can I just ask, because this is the point I was trying to get to. Um, yeah, just like in Peshul Chavakuk um, and the Qumran schools and the Samaritans, there are quite a few places where temple worship is kind of cleansed of its defilement, right? So is Jesus talking about cleansing the defilement of the temple? Or is he saying that temple worship, temple sacrifice is done, in a sense, as early Christianity post-destruction, um, understands it, I think. Well, and uh, that, thank you for redirecting, Elon. Um, what, um, what we have 
is Jesus addressing the financial inequities, the financial problems, not not the uh, not the avodah. He doesn't say anything about the uh, about the sacrifices. Uh, uh, the the uh, the neviim in Tanakh speak of that, but Jesus doesn't. What he says, he says, uh, you have um, taken this house of prayer that's supposed to be for all nations, and there he's quoting Yeshayahu, and then he says, but you have turned it into a den of thieves, and there it's an interesting thing that he's doing. It's, it's very rabbinic. He's combining. This is what it's supposed to be in Yeshayahu, and he says, you've turned it into a den of thieves, which is from um, uh, Yirmiyahu Anavi. So he's doing something there. I think he's signaling. I think, did I mention already with you guys the, the principle that Chazal used and that, that Yeshua uses of hypertexting? You know how you hypertext in a computer? If you click on the link, you get more. Yeah, so he's he's bringing people's minds back to um, the Yirmiyahu. I think it's Perik Sheva, and there he says, uh, Yirmiyahu says, the priesthood is committing idolatry and they're committing spiritual and literal um, adultery, going after other women, going after other gods, and because of that, Jeremiah says. I'm going to do to this house what I did to my house when it was at Shiloh. It's a very, very fascinating thing uh, that's that's going on there in those texts. And he's he is hinting at, as did Jeremiah, he's hinting hinting at uh, the destruction of the um, of the Beit Mikdash. Mm -hmm. Um, which would, I guess, in, in direct answer to your question, Elon, um, I think it's Elon that we're talking, um, uh, that uh, there will be an end to the sacrificial system, but it wasn't in his lifetime. It wasn't that day. Um, and it would be decades, years and years into the future. But what he was, he was, he was signaling to them, there is a major need for reform, a major need for reform, especially among um, the, the Kohanim and uh, with respect to uh, the cost of um, sacrifice. We had one more question I saw from uh, Shmuel. That will be our last question of the day. So Shmuel, you still have that question? Shmuel. Shmuel. You, are, ah. you need to unmute, Shmuel. I pass, I pass. I, I already have the, the, the answer. Okay. Somebody asked the same question. Perfect. So then you can say you can save your time for next time, Shmuel. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I write this. I don't know. Uh, question. Just a question on on while we're on the subject. You sent me some. Uh, Wave. You sent me some of the articles that you'd written last okay. year weren't included in the powerpoints, but you thought might be useful. Okay. Uh, and what the, we just got the mention by, sorry, I forget who mentioned what. Um, I think it was Ilan. Yeah, okay, Ilan mentioned the concept of the Sanhedrin and so on. Yes. Obviously, a lot of misunderstandings about what, you know, what is it a, a bunch of, like a, a lynching by a bunch of Sadducees and priests, or is it Sanhedrin? We go into that issue. We do deal with that when we're in the old city. Uh, but you have articles, for example, there's one here I can see in this directory I've got, which is called The Enemies of Jesus Highlighted, of which Jesus. you updated in, which you updated, uh, I don't know, back in uh, early, in late 19, uh, 2020. And then you've got the original one, Enemies of Jesus, it's from January 20. And there's also The Prayers of Jesus, which you sent me later after we, would, we had a discussion. Uh, the question is, uh, are you OK if I share these with the group? Yes, I'm absolutely happy to have for them to have that. And in that, who, the enemies of Jesus, you have those the the text about Baba Ben Buta, uh, about uh, Rabbi Shimon Ben Gamliel, and a right. whole bunch of other stuff. Okay, so it was basically it it cl helped clarify because I you know, when, when I've been doing this with people, I'm, I found it a little bit difficult to uh, to uh, quantify exactly 
uh, I remember that it was either you in the very, very early on, or I think it was you that mentioned this. They call it the Trinity of Evil going on in Jerusalem between the Romans, the Sadducees, and who was the third? Who was the third? Oh, the aristocracy. The aristocracy were basically also, also Sadducees. And to, to, and to understand from the gospel context who it is that is actually persecuting it, uh, as opposed to the Pharisees, where I often like to say to people um, who are different types of evangelical Christians, I say, can I ask you a question? Do you hate Catholics? And they'll say to me, no, of course we don't hate them. We have a different theology to them. We believe in the, sa in, in the same Messiah, but we don't hate them. You know, we might feel pity for the way they've been we feel they've been misled or they feel we've been misled but but that's what it's like i said exactly so it do you think really that the fire that's often the word pharisee is used as a defamation it's used as a i've heard it used as a uh, derogative as something a, a definition of evil whereas actually what is going on between jesus and the pharisees is an entirely internal classic late second temple jewish debate they're not persecuting him they are haranguing him with questions in order to see where he stands on the oral law and they may dispute with him but they come back with questions i say to them, if you hate someone you've got a really big issue with someone you chase after them for two and a half years on something asking questions or you just say i don't want to have anything to do with that person so it's hatred is a wrong word it's not hatred it is a an entirely internal theological dispute and we see and th remember this is the time long before the Mishnah it's the time before pe things have been fixed let's say and any well-known teacher can create an opinion and if other rabbis use that as a precedent then he's considered a great rabbi and it doesn't matter what time this can happen it can happen from the third century BC it can happen right the way through to the destruction and beyond it really? so this is something that people is I think is very important to illustrate to groups that there is a misnomer in the fact that if you look in the texts in the gospels from the minute he is placed in Gethsemane, there's, there's virtually no other mention of Pharisees. I mean, Pharisees would not ever want to hand over a fellow Jew to the, to the Romans for execution on the festival of freedom. In fact, that would be something that would, could be brought up in the Sanhedrin to sentence someone to Din Rodef for the uh, judgment that chases them to the end of the earth for having done such a thing. Whereas for the Sadducees, where their pocket was more important and the threat to their wealth and their power was more important, these are the people who have really got it in for him at the end. And he doesn't get in trouble with anyone until he starts threatening them. We, we're going to speak about this when we're going to be in Jerusalem and also in Capernaum. And also emphasize the fact that the Bible speaks about the leaders of the Pharisees, which was basically, as Adrian just said, it's a rabbinical debate. The Pharisees are not the bad guys. They really are not the bad guys. He preached to the Pharisees. They were a part of the multitude. When they came for the loaves and, 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 and fish, it was the Pharisees. Most of them were Pharisees. So we will speak a lot about this when we're going to be in the uh, Sea of Galilee area and also in the day we're going to be in uh, uh, the Southern Excavation. We will speak quite a lot about about that um wait if you have anything to conclude because i want to be respectful of your time and then i'm going to go over the uh, itinerary for tomorrow okay uh yes i i would like to add this uh this idea of the perushim being the bad guys not anybody else not the chief priests not the aristocracy not even hardly the romans it's, the, it's for some reason we've focused in uh, Christianity on the perushim, which is very unfortunate. Um, it's so ingrained in the um, the minds, the psyche of um, even Protestants. I, I think more so um, the the Catholic and the Eastern tradition, uh, less so, but it's still very strong in Protestantism um, and the evangelical groups. But uh, it's it's a, a, it would be a very helpful thing for you. The, the, how do we handle this? We've got the data. You, you will have, they will, Adrian, right? They'll have the enemies of Jesus. Yeah, yeah. You'll, you have the data. I'm going to send you all that in email. Right. You, you have the data. Some of it's biblical or, or New Testament. Some of it's the other, all this other stuff. Um, but um, 
it it would be good before you get to like the Vol Museum or somewhere in Jerusalem where this discussion is probably going to come up about the last days of Jesus and who was responsible, et cetera, et cetera, for what happened to have a discussion with the leader of the group, if that's a pastor or some other academic or whatever, talk to them over coffee at dinner one night at the hotel, something like that, and ask to kind of put, get the stuff inside of you, get comfortable with it, then ask the, um, the person how they would like that to be handled. And even if you, if they would be interested in having you share material with them and have them uh, to, uh, to um, address uh, these issues from the, based on the evidence with the group when you're studying on location. How does that sound to you, Adrian and, and Omer? Okay. The, 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 reason, the reason is some of these, you know the, the phrase sacred cow, like in <laughs> Hinduism? There are these sacred cows, these, um, these mokshim that you can step on and um, no need if you can work through a way that the, the leader is comfortable with, then it's going to go over better with your group. We're going to speak, we're going to have a full session about this in the tours. What is the role of the tour guide in an evangelical group? So you, 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 you burst into a completely open and elaborate door. So uh, we will Good. speak about that. Uh, that's, so just, that's just my advice. That's all. You can didn't cost an extra shekel. <laughs> no, but it's it's good. It doesn't. It's good to cover it because it is yeah. the yes. very very basic. Yeah, folks, I will stop this recording uh, actually right now.